hello everyone and welcome to this talk. Uh, this talk is about low overhead, zero instrumentation profiling in the context of open telemetry and uh, more specifically about the eBPF profiling agents that Elastic has recently donated to open telemetry. My name is Chrysos Kalkanis. I'm currently working as a principal engineer at Elastic. Uh, I'm also a maintainer of the open telemetry profiling SIG and a co-author and maintainer of the open telemetry eBPF profiler that is the subject of this talk. I took this slide from one of my favorite Alan Kay presentations. Uh, it's called Making Progress, and I highly recommend you watch it. It's a photograph of the NASA Mission Control Center, and the last line at the bottom reads, software organizations who don't have a situation room don't understand where they are. Now, in this and other presentations, Alan argues for biologically inspired approaches to modeling com complex systems with continuous feedback uh, play playing a, a prominent role. I think that this is highly relevant to today's complicated observability landscape as information proliferation and the move to highly distributed microservice heavy architectures is making it a lot harder to distinguish uh, signal from noise. So this is something that continuous profiling can definitely help with. Thomas Dulian uh, has talked about the cloud becoming the new operating system. And uh, from this point of view, Continuous profilers can be seen as tools that are native to and designed for this uh, new substrate. As an example, uh, many companies have difficulty mapping CPU consumption down to specific lines of code and uh, tracking performance regressions over time. Some hyperscalers have had data center wide continuous profiling for some time, for example, Google. Uh, they call it Google wide profiling. They've even published a few papers about it. Uh, so, and those papers have been very influential. Uh, but generally speaking, continuous uh, profiling hasn't been widely available. Uh, contemporary profilers do not work well with production binaries that are usually compiled without frame pointers and without symbols, and they don't typically support high-level languages without application instrumentation. It would be great uh, if we could make a lightweight, data center-wide uh, continuous profiler that could be easily deployed uh, and supports all widely used programming languages available to everyone. And uh, this is exactly what we try to accomplish in a startup called Optimize Cloud, uh, where in 2021, we launched the low overhead, multi-runtime, uh, zero instrumentation profiler. Shortly after that, we were acquired by Elastic. And in 2024, Elastic decided to donate the profiling agent to OpenTelemetry whilst continuing to support uh, and evolve its functionality. We see this profiler as something that complements, uh, but does not replace traditional observability solutions. And this includes profilers that are based on application instrumentation, as the sets of trade-offs and capabilities are typically different across the two approaches. Our profiler is based on eBPF, which is technology that gives us a way to insert and execute a new code inside the Linux kernel in a safe manner without having to implement a kernel module. It was originally designed for packet filtering, uh, but people eventually realized that it could be used for all sorts of other things and drastically extended the set of problems that eBPF could be applied to. The profiler does not require application instrumentation or restarts of any kind and supports both native code and code executing in higher level uh, language runtimes. It offers us whole system visibility uh, all the way down into the kernel. Now on the performance front, uh, we aim for low CPU and memory overheads in order to make running the profiler continuously in production possible at all times. Our current targets are less than 1% system CPU and less than 250 megabytes of memory, and that's for, for the typical case. Now here you can see a very high level architectural diagram of, of how the agent is split into components. Uh, essentially, we have two components here, the kernel space component and the user space component. The kernel space component is implemented in eBPFC and the user space component in Go. Uh, during in initialization of the agent, we set up all the eBPF maps, load the unwinder programs into the kernel, and configure the various event pumps. Data exchange between the two components, kernel user space, generally takes place over eBPF maps, uh, although we also use perf events for messaging. Now we can see here that both the eBPF programs running in the kernel, but also the user space agent process can read uh, target process memory. The eBPF programs will do that during unwinding and the user space agent process will do that during high level language symbolization. 
And so there's another part here, on the part of the user space Go agent that I'm not gonna show to you, but we call it the process manager. It's responsible for tracking processes that are executing on the target system, executable mappings in those processes, and then extracting information from those processes and placing it in eBPF maps. This is another very high level overview of how we do CPU profiling using sampling uh, via eBPF. Generally, uh, eBPF lets us attach programs to various parts of the kernel. Now, in this specific case, we attach to the kernel timer interrupt and uh, run our code at 20 hertz. This means that 20 times a second, the kernel will interrupt every non-idle CPU core on the system and run our eBPF program, which will immediately begin unwinding the stack at the point of interruption until the thread entry point is reached. Uh, now, during stack unwinding, I have an arrow there. You can see it loops back from uh, step three to step two uh, because we can automatically switch between native and high-level language unwinding depending on where in memory the program counter points. And for example, this allows us to seamlessly capture stack traces that contain Python or Java frames calling into a C library. Uh, finally, once the thread entry point is reached, uh, the stack frames produced by unwinding are reported to user space uh, for additional processing. And there are some more processing operations that I'm not going to show here for in the interest of time, such as caching and enriching traces with uh, container, Kubernetes metadata, and so on. Now, I'm going to go a little bit more uh, deep into unwinding, so make sure that everybody understands what's happening. Uh, this is a visual representation of a thread stack as it's stored in memory. So we can see that this uh, stack is comprised of three stack frames. So when unwinding, we begin at the lowest uh, frame uh, and try to recover all the return addresses that have been placed on the stack. Now, return addresses are essentially program counter values that point to executable code in memory. If a program is compiled with uh, frame pointers enabled, then we can simply walk the linked list starting from the current value of the frame pointer register, which is going to point to the frame pointer from the previous uh, frame, which points to the frame pointer of the previous frame, and so on. Uh, this process is called stack walking or unwinding. And the end result is a stack trace that contains stack frames that encapsulate a snapshot of all function calls in the thread that is being un unwound uh, at that point in time. Now, unfortunately, native code doesn't usually come with frame pointers. Uh, this decision is a remnant of the register starved 32 bit x86 Intel architecture which uh, led compilers to using the frame pointer register as a general purpose register. Now today with the AMD64 and ARM64 architectures, they offer us a lot more general purpose registers, so that's less of a problem. And so there's recently been a shift towards compiling code with frame pointers in production. Uh, realistically, however, coverage will remain poor for quite some time as a lot of Linux distributions uh, don't yet support this. So as you can see here in this stack, if we, if we try to unwind this, again, we're going to start at the lowest frame. We don't have anything to follow in order to get to the next frame. So for a solution that's going to work everywhere, including with code that doesn't have frame pointers, uh, we need some mechanism to give us the next frame uh, for unwinding. And uh, this mechanism in this case is the EEH frame section in an executable. The EEH frame was originally intended for C++ unwinding, for example, when an exception is thrown in, a, in C++ code, the stack needs to be unwound until a handler is found. And then execution will resume at the handler with all the intermediate stack frames being thrown away. Now, it turns out that one can reuse this information uh, in order to unwind stacks for profiling. This is also possible because the EH frame section is present in almost every native executable uh, to enable interoperability, where, for example, a C library can call into a C++ library that could throw an exception, then we'd want that exception to propagate upwards and unwind through the, the, the C library to callers of the C library. So uh, what happens is that a compiler will typically emit this information even for non-C++ binaries. Now the data in the EH frame section is stored in a format that uh, is called dwarf, and that's essentially a virtual machine. Uh, that data, due to its flexibility, is not easy to parse, especially from eBPF. So for that reason, the profiling agent pre-processes the dwarf data. Uh, we basically shape it into something a lot simpler that eBPF can easily consume. And then we populate the eBPF maps that the unwinding programs running into the kernel can, can access. For Go, uh, for Go binaries, the EH frame section may not be present. So uh, we use the Go PCL and tab section instead. This is essentially is an internal to Go data structure 
that also contains the information we need to unwind stacks and which Go itself uh, uses in order to create its own stack traces. And finally, uh, for high-level language uh, stacks, uh, we use runtime-specific logic to, to unwind them. I'll, I'll come back to this in a little bit. The native unwinder is an ABPF program uh, that's running inside the kernel. Uh, we can also see this as a very simple virtual machine, and this is a rough translation to pseudocode. We start, by, uh, we start unwinding by reading the register state from the process that we've interrupted, and then we extract the current frame and append it to the current stack trace. And then we load and execute an unwinding instruction based on the current value of the program counter and the current PID. The instruction tells us how to proceed and how to unwind the next frame. The output of the native unwinder is essentially a stack trace, and that's composed of a list of frames, where each frame is composed of a module ID and an offset within that module. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit later you know, how that uh, is actually used. For high-level language uh, unwinders, we also implement those in eBPF, but they work differently. Uh, so every language with subroutines needs some way to keep track of function calls in memory, otherwise you wouldn't know where to return to after a call. So what we did here is we, we reverse engineered every language runtime that we support in order to figure out how it keeps track of stack frames and how it constructs its own stack traces. Then we essentially re-implemented the same logic in eBPF. Uh, by the way, sometimes a language runtime uh, will come with ZDB scripts that can produce stack traces for that runtime. That's very useful for debugging. By examining those scripts and rewriting the logic that they implement into eBPF, you now have an unwinder for that runtime. Uh, so the information that the agent makes available to uh, eBPF programs in order to enable unwinding for high-level languages can be very simple. For example, in Python, it's just a few struct offsets that, that we can statically extract, or more elaborate. For example, in Hotspot, uh, we need to include locations of heaps and zit regions and so on. But the general idea is that we do a lot of the work up front in user space in order to make the kernel unwinding logic in eBPF uh, as simple and as performant as we possibly can. Creating an unwinder for a very complicated runtime like a hotspot is a lot of work. But uh, once we've done all the work and now we have the unwinder, runtimes usually don't change that much from version to version. Uh, for example, for, for minor version updates, it's very often the case that we don't have to update anything. Uh, our unwinders keep working. So for major version updates, in a lot of cases, we can use uh, GDB scripting to automatically extract offsets that have changed. Now, someone may ask, why go through all this effort, uh, especially since a lot of high-level languages now support uh, JITdump and perfdump. Those are relatively simple formats that can map program counter values to function names, and they're also supported by the Linux perf tooling. The answer here is that they're not enabled by default, so they require restarting the target process, uh, rebuilding a container. But uh, you know, they only give us function names, so we cannot get uh, file names, no line numbers, and they don't support inline functions. But more importantly for us, uh, working with these formats can be very time, uh, very CPU intensive, uh, and that makes them unsuitable for low overhead continuous profiling. Like as an example, I have here a snippet taken from the .NET core documentation. And as you can see, if you enable uh, perfmaps or JITdumps, you can incur a 10 to 20% C CPU hit. Now, for a lot of production deployments, this is completely unacceptable. These are all the languages that we currently support. I'm only showing a few native languages that compile to native code, but essentially, we support every language that produces native executables with a functional EEH frame section, which is most of them. Uh, regarding not having ARM64 support for .NET and Node.js, uh, there's no technical limitation there. It's just we just haven't gotten around to doing that yet. But uh, contributions are very welcome. And these are all the minimum kernel versions that we support. Generally, we try to support uh, the oldest kernel that we can reasonably get away with without compromising too much on performance. And for us, generally, this means LTS kernels. Now, 4.19, as you see here, it's, it's pretty old at this point, but we're still supporting it. Now, for ARM, the minimum version is a bit higher because there exists a breaking bug where it's impossible to read user memory in any version prior to 5.4. Now, there might be Linux distributions uh, that have backported the fix, but we decided not to deal with that at all as the, the number of folks that use older kernels on ARM is, should be fairly low. And uh, on the low left, you can see a rough metric, which is lines of code, uh, you can yeah, see this as a complexity metric of our various high-level language unwinders. As expected, the hotspot unwinder is our most complicated one. 
but if you look at the bottom, PHP and Ruby, they're relatively simple at less than 300 lines of code, and that includes uh, comments. Now, the, the minimum kernel versions that we support also introduce the constraints uh, that we have to work with in terms of what we can do with eBPF. eBPF is not a stable uh, uh, thing. It changes with every kernel version. So new eBPF helpers become available, new functionality, and so on. So the first limitation is we cannot loop, as the verifier cannot prove whether a loop will terminate. So what we need to do instead is to tell the compiler to unroll all our loops, which also means that we can dynamically set the number of loop iterations. Now, every loop iteration that we unroll will increase the total program size. And this is important because we only have 4,096 instructions per program to, to work with. We can partly work around this by using tail calls, which are BPF to BPF program calls that essentially replace the calling program uh, with the program that's been called. There is no going back to the caller. And we can do 32 of these tail calls, which means that in total we have 32 times 4,096, so that's around 120,000 instructions to work with. And it turns out that these are more than enough for, for unwinding. Now, there are some other annoyances and gotchas, uh, like everyone here who's worked with the BPF uh, will surely recognize. Later kernel versions give us more flexibility. Uh, they have better and more general looping constructs. But it will take a while before these kernels propagate widely to production. So for now, we're sticking with the lowest common denominator. Uh, yeah, so since our high-level language unwinders depend on runtime internals, new versions of runtimes could change some of their internals, and this means that they could break our unwinders. Uh, so we need a way to reliably detect regressions over time. To enable these regression tests, we compile our unwinders against, we have a user space sim implementation of the BPF helper functions, and this allows us to run the unwinders as regular executables, and even run them inside a debugger, such as GDB, and we can single step through their execution. Uh, we decided to use core dumps, which are snapshots of a process in execution that include memory mappings and thread states. The unwinders perform all the memory reads using the same eBPF helper functions that they typically use in the kernel, except now in, this, uh, in the te test suite, uh, those reads are transparently targeting the core dumps, which essentially act as simulated processes. Now on the right, uh, you can see how a test case looks like in JSON. Uh, I have a parallel test case here. Uh, we can see that it has both high-level Perl and native code stack frames. Now, in this example, there's only one thread, but of course, uh, a test case can also contain multiple threads. With every thread, we include the exact unwinding and also symbolization information uh, when it's available. Now, in order to make the core dumps available to everyone that clones the repository and wants to run the test suite, we store them in Oracle Cloud in an S3-compatible sync. That's all managed by OpenTelemetry. We consider Git LFS, but given the very low per repository quotas, it's a bad fit for an open source project that we have no control over who clones it and who wants to run the, the test suite. Now, besides unwinding, the other major operation, uh, uh, which produces, uh, which the agent performs, is symbolization. Uh, symbolization essentially takes a stack frame, uh, a stack trace as produced by unwinding, and annotates the frames with symbolic information, such as function name, uh, file name, line number, and so on. Now, as an example here on the left, you can see a stack trace that was produced by unwinding, and on the right, the same stack trace that's now symbolized. Uh, now, this is a native stack trace, and the top two stack frames are kernel frames, and the bottom two are user space frames belonging to a Go application. For native executables, uh, symbols are not typically present in production, as they can be hundreds of megabytes or even gigabytes uh, in size. So this means that we need another way to perform symbolization after the agent has uh, picked up the profiling data, uh, possibly on the back end. We can do that uh, by relying on module IDs, which are unique identifiers for executable or shared library files. Now on the right, we can see some examples of different build IDs that the compiler uh, generates and inserts into binaries that it creates. Some of these build IDs can be used as module IDs, but uh, they, they come with issues. For example, the, the Go uh, build ID is specific to Go only, and the GNU build ID may not always be present. Like, for example, in Alpine Linux, it doesn't exist, and Alpine is very uh, widely used in Docker containers. But even if it's present, the GNU build ID uh, could be low cardinality or it could be completely nulled out with garbage. So th that essentially invalidates it as a unique identifier for an executable. So what we did here, we uh, introduced our own custom hashing scheme, uh, which is pretty simple. Essentially, we concatenate the first and last pages of an executable file together with its length. 
Uh, it's a very simple uh, scheme, uh, very fast to execute, but we found out that it works also very well in practice. Now, besides using this custom hashing scheme, the agent can also record and report the other build ID types if they're present, uh, but, and this is useful for interoperability. For example, like one can use the GNU build ID to query symbol servers or interface with other tooling that supports uh, GNU build IDs. And one last thing to note here is that uh, while the agent could symbolize native stack traces on the targets, meaning on the machine that it's executing on, if the symbols are present there, this is not currently done. And the expectation is that symbolization will take place after the fact uh, on the back end, for example. Now, we are working towards supporting this scenario, and we're going to start with Go executables, which in the vast majority of cases uh, come with symbols. Uh, since symbols for high-level languages are always present on the target inside the memory space of the process that is being profiled, the agent can extract them directly from the target. However, for some runtimes, uh, extracting these symbols may not be straightforward as we have to walk very complicated data structures. Uh, so to keep the complexity of the eBPF code low and also to operate within the constraints I mentioned before uh, that are imposed on us by the minimum kernel versions that we support, we decided to perform symbolization uh, for code from high-level languages in user space. This means that the unwinding programs for high-level languages do minimal work. Uh, they typically extract some offset or pointer values, send them to user space, and then user space code can actually chase those values in order to extract symbols from the target process memory space. And the last line here, you can see that this leaves us open to some race conditions because there is a time that passes from the point where the stack trace is generated in the kernel in BPF, and you know, it's sent to user space and then symbolization takes place. For example, short-lived processes, if they go away, then you cannot really reach inside them and, and extract the symbols. But it, it, there, those sort of races are infrequent and the agent operates on uh, an eventual consistency model anyway. So it's perfectly okay. Now the profiling uh, agent reports all the collected data using the old TEP uh, profiling signal. This is a new signal type that we've also introduced uh, this year in April. We started out with Google PPROF as the base, but in the interest of uh, rapid evolution, we've since decided to break wire compatibility with PPROF and instead we strive for convertibility. Uh, this new profiling signal is stateless, unidirectional, and works on top of gRPC. We want to have first-class support for continuous profiling, but also instrumentation and SDKs. And of course, in interoperability with other open telemetry signals is very high priority. Uh, the new signal type is still experimental. It's undergoing a lot of breaking changes. On, on one hand, this can be annoying, especially to consumers and implementers, but on the other hand, this is the only way for us to experiment with different use cases and better explore the solution space. So feedback on that front is greatly appreciated, and please get involved with the discussions taking place in the profiling SIG if you have a particular use case that you'd like to see covered. We hope that we can stabilize the new signal type uh, sometime in the new year. Now, regarding the backends, the profiling agent can talk to any backend that supports the OTLP profiling signal. Now, currently, this is the Elastic Universal Profiling backend, Polar Signals, Pyroscope, and Datadog was coming soon. I last talked to Felix a couple of weeks ago. Now, at the time of this talk, there may be additional vendors who have added support uh, for the OTLP profiling signal. For experimentation and debugging, Elastic also makes available a standalone backend uh, in the form of a desktop application that you can run on your Linux or Mac workstation. We call it DevFiler. Uh, this is not currently open source, but we're working on open sourcing it. My, my guess is it's going to happen very soon. Our top priority at the moment is to integrate the profiling agent with the OpenTelemetry collector and have it run as an OpenTelemetry collector receiver. Uh, this will allow us to run the collector as an agent and have it record profiles and forward them using OTLP. Now, towards that end, we've recently introduced OTLP profiling support to the collector. It can now receive, process, and export OTLP profiling data. If you want more information about this and a way to actually try this out for yourself, you can see the linked blog post that I have at the bottom over there. Now, this is a very rough roadmap. The indicators at the bottom, you can take them to be milestones or months, uh, with the caveat that you know, none of this is fixed. Support for LuaJIT is expected to land very soon. Uh, we're currently reviewing it. We're also working on off-CPU profiling. Uh, this is also in review. Now, regarding symbolization, we are working towards, uh, as I said, having the agent do native executable symbolization on the target, but uh, also working on a separate symbol upload protocol uh, which we'd like to specify as part of our telemetry, and that can be used for bulk symbol uploads. Uh, regarding the profiling signal, as I said, our top priority is stabilization. We're cleaning up various PPROF related bits and pieces, uh, also working on uh, semantic conventions for profiling and a specification for profiling, and uh, also on a proposal for better supporting discrete events. 
for the open telemetry collector, we're working on the receiver uh, and we're also updating various processors. We could use a lot more help here. If you're currently relying on a receiver or a processor and you'd like it to support profiling, you know, please do get involved. In the future, we'd like to support more runtimes. For example, I have Erlang here. We, we've had some preliminary discussions. It can definitely happen. Uh, and I've also listed some other ideas that we've discussed in the past. But uh, finally, and uh, most importantly, it's still early days for profiling in Otel, and there's a lot of unexplored potential. So all of us can realize it uh, if we all get involved. Now, I'm going to attempt a live demo, uh, but be before I do that, so I have here two links. Uh, those links are to the artifacts that you can use if you want to do uh, the demo for yourself. Uh, unfortunately, we're not making releases of the binary releases of the agent, so you're going to have to go to the repository, clone it, and compile the agent yourself. You can use this commit SHA over there to ensure that you're going to get something that at least works. As I said, there are a lot of breaking changes, so there's no guarantee that if you just clone and compile the current main that this is going to work. But if, if you use this commit, then this will work because I've, I've tried it myself. And the filer you can download also from that link if you use that uh, authorization token. Now, let me... Okay, cool. So this is the, the filer application. I usually I run this all the time, uh, you know, because the, and, and I have the agent running on my uh, Linux VM, which is my main development VM. So right here, you can see some tag frames. It's previously collected. Uh, this is the flame graph view. On the top, there is also a timeline with uh, samples. You can pan and also zoom in focus on specific time span. We also have a top end functions view, so you can see how much specific, how much CPU, relative CPU a specific function is, is consuming. On the executable tabs, if you drag and drop a binary here, then uh, the dev filer application will extract all the symbols and uh, symbolized stack traces that it has previously recorded, so you can do symbolization after the fact in a very similar manner as what you will be doing uh, if you were doing it on the back end. So, with that said, now let me actually run some workloads. So I'm going to start with uh, the Java benchmark here. I hope you can all read the, the frame information. So this is a, a Java stack tree. So the first thing you note here, besides the, like once you get past the terrible verbosity of, of Java stack traces, is that we have different colors for, for stack frames. For example, the stack frames in blue are native stack frames. Uh, the stack frames in green belong to uh, Java code that's executing on uh, the JVM. The stack frames in purple are kernel frames. So every uh, different language that we support has its own uh, color so you can quickly focus on something. Now, this benchmark that I executed here is doing HTTP uh, requests using Netty and uh, a high-performance Java library. So we would expect to start from uh, libc. So the frames at the top are the, the, the origin frames, and the, the frames at the bottom are the leaf frames. So the, 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 the bottom as frame is where we interrupted the CPU core. So in this case, we can see that we're going from libc into the JVM internals, and then into higher level code in Java. We scroll further down, we see that we're doing a system call in the kernel, in this case, writes and message. So we're actually sending packets uh, through the TCP path in the kernel. And this essentially shows us that 
uh, we have a similar stack trace here that can span everything, like from the kernel, all the layers of abstraction, into native code, into Java. Now I'm going to execute a different uh, Java workload. So this is a different benchmark here, and again, it's a Java, uh, you can say Java stack trace, but what I want to focus on here is this. I'm going to zoom in, hopefully you can see this. So if you look at the file names here, they end up in Scala. So Scala is a language that runs on the JVM, and the profiling agent has no uh, specific support for Scala. The R and winders just uh, know and expect hotspot. But what this shows is that we can essentially symbolize like every language that runs on top of the JVM, uh, and that's nice. Now let me run a Python workload. I'm going to show you what I'm going to essentially be executing here. So this, let me hopefully. So this is a minimal Python application. Uh, it's using the Pickupy, which is a wrapper for the C lib pickup packet capture library, and it opens a, a file. This file has uh, thousands of packets in there and essentially reads every packet and does some simulation of, of processing. So let me execute it. So here we have the, the Python stack trace. And what I want to show you with this example is that, again, we start in libc, then we enter the Python interpreter internals. These are written in C. And then we enter the high-level Python code. You can see here the, the, the code that I, I wrote. But what happens here is that when, when we do uh, the loop call here, we're providing a callback. So we're calling into C, we're calling into the libpickup library from Python, and that's what we see here, from Python into C, into libpickup, and we're passing a Python callback. So libpickup is going to call back into Python, and this is exactly what's happening here, to call our Python callback. So this demonstrates, again, that uh, the, the way we capture the stack happens in a seamless way, and we have the complete, this gives us the complete picture, picture of, of what's happening uh, in this case. And now I'm going to run another Python workload. So this is essentially a benchmark that does a lot of JSON deserialization and hashing of strings, so your, your typical uh, microservice, you could say. And you can see that if I zoom in here, we see the, you know, the JSON decode calls and so on, and then if I, if I look at some stack frames here, then you're going to see a lot of malloc operations taking place here because this is a memory-intensive uh, benchmark. But looking at the flame graph is not the best way to actually understand what's happening here because uh, the, the malloc calls are going to be distributed across many different stack traces. But if we switch to the top functions view, we can get a better idea of, of where the CPU is being spent. And we can see here that uh, we're essentially spending like a lot of time in glibc malloc. Uh, like if we add up all those numbers here, including three and malloc, we're spending more than 20% here of the CPU time just doing memory allocation. And this is a strong hint that maybe we could easily optimize this. And I'm going to now run the same benchmark, but what I'm doing now is um, so I've switched the memory allocator out to gemalloc instead of glibc. So now, as you can see, most of the time is actually being spent on the, the operations that the benchmark is doing, the serialization, parsing of strings, and hashing. And you don't see the 20% uh, time. I mean, it's not zero. There is some again, memory allocation overhead in the malloc here as well, but it's, it's, a lot, uh, it's a lot better than what we had before. So with that, 
I conclude the demo and uh, I want to thank everyone, especially I want to thank everybody who has contributed to Open Telemetry Profiling and also all of you for, for coming and uh, experiencing this talk. And now, feel free to, to ask questions. What language is the desktop app in? Sorry, could, could you what, repeat that? Yeah, what? what language is the desktop app written in? What languages we do not have? No, the desktop app, the um, Debfiler. Debfiler, what, what language is, is it implemented in? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's written in Rust and it's using, it's essentially written like a, a game because it's refreshing 60 frames a second. It's using what we call an immediate mode uh, UI library. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So what about multi-threaded programs? So you showed single-threaded program in your examples. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. So what about multi-threaded programs? Like you showed a single-threaded examples. Like how does it show up? In yeah, there is no, there is absolutely no difference. It doesn't make any difference because, as I said, the once the kernel. Uh, the kernel timer interrupts every non-idle CPU core on the system. If, if you have 20 cores executing code, then you're going to get 20 different stack traces, one stack trace per core. So threads just work. There is nothing that we have to do separately for that. Hey, thank you. Um, would it be possible to profile eBPF programs as well as user space programs? Uh, yeah, currently we don't do that. Uh, Maybe that's something that uh, we could consider. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christos. Uh, my question is about uh, correlation with uh, the SDK context. Um, right. Are there any plans, or what are the plans for the correlation between a specific trace and uh, some of these profiles? Yeah, so we had a talk uh, the other day, Jonas uh, from Elastic and myself. Uh, it's recorded, and that talk goes into detail of how we actually do that. So we do have support for correlation. Like we, you can have trace and span IDs be essentially added to a stack trace. Uh, we use thread local storage for that. Uh, we're currently supporting Java, but you know, essentially we can support any language, even languages that have virtual threads and they mount. Uh, lightweight threads on top of operating system threads, as long as we have a way to actually uh, detect when that takes place. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we can expect that, I, I would say, to land in open telemetry uh, sooner rather than later. It's definitely something that we want to, to add. Okay, thank you. <laughs>